Hi everyone, George Farmer here, content creator for Tropica Aquarium Plants, and this is our third episode of Tropica Live. I'm so excited to be here, I hope you guys are too. Uh, welcome, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, please do use the live chat throughout this workshop. It's gonna last around an hour or so. We've got our experts on hand on the live chat to answer any of your questions. And do use it as an opportunity to give us feedback, chat amongst yourselves as well, and yeah, just have fun. Uh, I'd like to thank the entire Tropica team for helping us out with this Tropica Live. It's not just me and the guests, there's loads of things going on in the background, including Thomas, our webmaster, who's controlling the cameras. We've got Radu, the coordinator, who's going to tell me when I go wrong. <laughs> and we've got Jonas, our plant expert, on the live chat, like I said. And we've got our special guest, which I'm going to introduce shortly. So we're going to now go into our first giveaway which is from our survey so you need to be subscribed to our newsletter for a chance to win these kind of giveaways so make sure you're subscribed to that and you'll get opportunities to get updates on future tropical lives and prizes so the winner is lorenzo pruno congratulations congratulations lorenzo if you email live at tropica.com from the Gmail address that you've registered your, uh, or your, your email that you've registered uh, your newsletter with. So before we go any further, let's go into our lovely Tropica merch video. Okay, so without further ado, let's introduce our very special guest and dear friend of mine, Ty, Ty Streetman. Come on, Ty. So Ty is a freshwater biologist and author. Uh, as I said, dear friend of mine, we've known each other quite a few years now. Since like 2014, 2015 or so. Yeah, and I'm just so excited to be here with you. How have you enjoyed your tropical experience so far? It's been amazing. It's been a real privilege to be here and it's been so exciting to see how everything works and meet the team yeah. and just, yeah, it was like yesterday we were dancing through <laughs> sort of plants in the greenhouse. Dancing? Yeah, well, I think, I think there was a skip in your set yeah, and um, oh, yeah. it was really fantastic. So it's been a great experience. Oh, thanks for coming. We really oh, appreciate it. Coming. And I know loads of people are super excited about this one. So thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. So we have our first giveaway question. Uh, what is the name of the wood decor? We haven't got it to hand right now, but if you did subscribe to the newsletter, you will know. The name of the wood decor we're using in this aquascape today. So type away and you will pick a random winner and announce that at the end. So make sure you stay all the way through to the end. So uh, I guess we should ask what is a biotope? And to help explain, we do have a, a lovely slideshow featuring some of my old uh, biotope aquascapes that I've created. I think I created my first one in 2008 and I created quite a few actually mm. for a series for Practical Fishkeeping magazine. Do you remember those? I do remember them. I remember being inspired by several of them. Yeah. Uh, the Rio Nanai with the, with Angel the Nanai fish. angelfish, yeah. uh, your little Cambodian blackwater. Oh yeah, yeah. And the uh, Myanmar Lake Inlay Tank. Oh, with so the was, Rami, Rami, Asian, Asian Rami 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 Each one of those, I was like, whatever I've done before, I thought I'm going to throw that out and have a go at doing this. Oh, great. And, yeah. and it's kind of gone full circle because now you inspire me with all your knowledge. And, and so it's a real kind of real great knowledge exchange. So very grateful for that. Uh, so yeah, I've been creating biotopes, like I said, for, for a while now. I don't create so many these days, but the reason I, I was creating so many was actually for practical fish keeping. And they were kind of, yeah, we want you to do some aquascaping, but let's make it more interesting, do biotopes. And I actually found that whole learning process because I had mm. to research the fish, research the habitats. I think I used fishbase.org, remember that? Fishbase, yeah. And it's still going, Seriously it? Fish Seriously Fish is another so these are really good resources online that you can you can use to gather data 
to get the relevant information, water chemistry, temperatures, plants, yep. you know, general ecology, you know, and all that good stuff. So if you do want to create your own uh, biotopes, then those are good resources, aren't they? I would say even try um, sites like ResearchGate. There's lots of scientific articles on there. Some okay. of them you can't access publicly, but some you can. Yeah. So if you just type in, you know, neon tetra habitat yeah. uh, PDF, you might get a scientific article about those fish and that habitat wow. done by done by proper academics and ah, you can, you can check them out. Awesome. So um, let's talk about what biotope we're creating today, Tom. Yeah. Um, so we're doing a biotope that's based on habitat I know very well, which is the Rio Sucuri in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul in Brazil. Okay. Um, and it's a sort of highland stream. And it's what's called a cast stream. So it's uh, fed by underground springs that come up through a lime, limestone bedrock, bubble through the substrate, through the rock, and create a crystal clear river system, oh, wow. at least for the first uh, kilometers. Yeah. And um, because the water is so transparent, there's lot, you know, tropical sunshine comes down, you get loads of aquatic plants, um, and a lot of these rivers are visited uh, by eco-tourists and right, okay. quite well known within Brazil. Um, but outside, they're not quite so, uh, so well known, so mm -hmm. I thought, well, we can try and popularize that place with a with a biotope from exactly. it. Exactly. And how long were you in Brazil for? So the last trip I was there for three years. Uh, when I yeah. went to do my masters, I was studying fishes in the Pantanal. Right. Um, but I was also doing some re research in the region where the, this biotope is based. Right. Um, but I've been visiting Brazil since 2007 and been able to see various different habitats and regions. And wow. it's a place I, I know quite well now. So. Yeah, exactly. And what, what was, um, so you did, you've done a master's in freshwater I did biology? my master's in animal biology. Animal, okay. Um, and I was studying the fish community of a river called the Salobra River, which is in the Pantanal wetlands. Okay. And basically no one had ever done any cataloging of the species there. Right. So my job was finding out what lives there and how abundant it was and how diverse the number of species and what differences there were between the wet season and the dry season. Oh, wow. And that meant spending a lot of time in the water doing observation, yeah. but also collecting with nets and, and data recording, and yeah, it was pretty amazing. So. It sounds amazing, and, and I'm sure there's people are watching some of the amazing footage right now. Yeah. And it's all your own footage? Yeah, so I spent a lot of time, hundreds of hours basically, wow. floating around swamps and rivers and lakes and in streams, and um, that's given me quite an insight into yeah. what's these habitats. Can you name any kind of particular highlights that you enjoyed? Any, is there any particular moment maybe um, that sticks out? Definitely. So one of them is being in a cast river like this. What's it called, cast river, by the way? It's the bedrock. It's the, the rock formation is called uh, cast. Oh, okay. So, Interesting. Um, and I'm sort of drifting along, and I see this sort of log type thing. And I'm like, what's this? And I put my head under, and I realize it's a great big anaconda. Oh, my god. And she was just kind of chilling out there. How big? Um, only about three meters, but in the water that feels a lot Big bigger. Enough. <laughs> Big enough. <laughs> and um, and just really cool to be, you know, next to such an amazing animal. Yeah. Um, and then in the Pantanal, particularly in the Slobber River, um, snorkeling with freshwater stingrays quite a lot. Um, you know, finding jaguar prints along the banks uh, when I'm looking at Echinodorus plants, and then oh, yeah. there's a jaguar print. And wow. So I think moments like that. Yeah. Um, and just things like being on a riverbank at night and there's fireflies and Milky Way above you and you shine your torch on the water and there's yeah. caiman and there's fish cruising around hunting at night and all those moments are special. That sounds so beautiful, like being so immersed in nature. Yeah. Yeah, when are we going? Um, well, I want to take, take <laughs> you there in May. Um, you'll just have to bring plenty of mosquito repellent because yeah. that is uh, yeah, very, yeah. very part of it, very much part of it. Okay, so let's uh, talk about uh, actual some of the stuff we're using today. Yeah. Uh, we have kindly donated the aquarium. This is a, what's it called? It's a Vistas Vista 75 F. F. So 75 centimeters long. Yep. Is it 30 or even less? 28 centimeters? 20, yeah, 20, 28, I think. Oh, um, 40. No, 40, no, 40, 40 uh, back to front. sorry, 25 high 25 and 40 high, front yeah. to back, yeah. So it's a shallow model. It's a shallow model, uh, low iron glass, really good quality silicon work. It's on a, a woody cabinet. Again, this is a WIO product. Really nice, nice rustic feel, quite trendy at the moment. And we've got the WIO bamboo light, which is, has adjustable settings in terms of spectrum and intensity. And we're turning that off right now. That's gonna just swing over there so we can aquascape, no problem. I've also got filtration fitted, but we'll turn that on later, of course. And we will be using CO2. We'll talk more about that later. So should we start? Doing some scaping. Yeah. So um, 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, let's yes, begin. Let's do some skating. Um, so we need to start really with our hardscape. Substrate. Substrate. Sorry. So we are using... We are using Tropica substrate. So we were considering using soil, but when we looked at the biotope uh, footage, there isn't real soil, is it? It's just mixed no. mixture of sand. So we yeah. tried to replicate that. In fact, we have supplied it, supplied the sands for us as well. And we'll talk more about those in more detail. So uh, in terms of what you actually saw in, mm. in um, the, in the biotype in the habitat, yes. yeah. What's it called, the river again? The Sukuri River, the which Sukuri. means the, the Anaconda River. Ah, oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So what does it look like? So it's very pale substrate in much of it, uh -huh. a mix of sort of almost white to grey to beige sands, and then areas of darker substrate, um, often fine, fine sand, and it's just a mix of organic material, ground down stone, um, and lots and lots and lots of tiny snail shells, oh, which interesting. also get crushed up. Yeah. Um, and this sand is being turned over all the time by lots of fish that grub through the sand foraging. Yeah. And so that acts as a sort of way of uh, sifting through it. And you're left with this really interesting mix of, of gradients and colors. And that will change with the flow of the water. If there's a, suddenly a stronger current after rain, oh. that will mix up the sands. Um, there's areas with some leaf litter around. Uh -huh. um, so it's quite diverse, but surprisingly pale substrate. People always think of, you know, oh, quite dark, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. murky, but not like that at all. Interesting. So this product is designed to be used as a nutrient-rich base layer, as opposed to the Tropica soil, which is a complete substrate. So we put this at the bottom, and I've deliberately not put any towards the front of the aquarium, so when we put our sand in, we don't see that dark area, and it looks a little bit unnatural. So we can leave the front area clear there. We want about a centimetre layer, so that's one two and a half litre bag of the Tropica substrate. And now for extra nutrients, because we do have a lot of heavy root feeding plants. And if you did subscribe to the newsletter, you'll have a bit of a preview of what those species will be. And I did have some capsules somewhere. There we are. Down there, yeah. So we're only going to use five capsules, but top tip, we can actually open them up. Do you want to do a couple? If you open up the shell and you can just sprinkle them evenly across the, the base, and that's just going to help feed the plants even more. We don't want to put too many in because it can actually kind of overload with nutrients and it can, we can cause algae blooms, so we don't put too many of these in. And you can use, you can use the, the capsules as a whole unit, um, target feed your, your plants with, and, and put them in with some tweezers. Top tip, you can actually pierce the shell with mm -hmm. a pin and, it, and the um, air, goes, air goes out and they don't try to pop up. Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. That Top. can be maddening, yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so just five of those sprinkled relatively evenly. Well, not maybe not so evenly, but I tell you what, that's where the big swords exactly, are going Exactly, that's why so I was... That's why you did it, right? Yeah, yeah there's always method to my madness. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so now the exciting bit, we're going to put the sand in. So we've got... Wood. No, we're not. We're going to put the wood in. Because we need to. Because we need to put the suction caps. Yes. Good job he's here. Yeah, I mean... What would you do without me? You wouldn't exactly. be doing any. <laughs> so we've got to have some pre-prepared bit We of have pre-prepared. We've even tied some moss on, which I don't usually do. So do you want to talk about why you've chosen this piece of wood and yeah. positioning it, etc.? So actually, this is, was provided to us by, by Wio. Yep. And I talked to Yago there, and he sent me a video of the bits of wood he had, and I chose this one specifically, and he sent it to us. Um, so basically, in this habitat, where you have plants, you don't have a lot of wood. And the reason for that is if, where you have shaded areas uh -huh. and plants can't grow, that's near the forest. So where you've got plants, you don't have overhanging trees, therefore you don't have a lot of wood, unless you have an entire tree that's fallen into the uh, river. Okay. Bit hard for us to uh, yeah, mimic that mimic here. That in a little tongue. Um, yeah. So you have kind of smaller bits of driftwood that are sometimes lifted up during uh, heavier storms by stronger currents. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly there, a lot of the wood is really textured because there are so many uh, loricarids, so armoured catfish, oh, okay. that are always grazing on the wood. They actually eat the wood. Yeah. Um, is that because there's nutrients in the wood, or is it there's like a microorganism? The phage is the name. Yeah, so okay. there'll be peritons, there'll be tiny organisms, there'll be alkwus, which is this mixture of tiny microscopic animals and, and plants that live on the surface of submerged wood and rock. Okay. And they'll be scraping that. And when you go there, you'll run your hands over the rock, over the wood. You can see it. All these little ridges from where they've been rasping away. So all the all the wood there has got uh, the marks of these catfish living in and on and around and feeding on them. And this piece just 
It looks nice. Looks nice. It looked like the kind of stuff I see out there. Yeah. Um, it's got a nice curve to it. Interesting texture. It fits within our display quite nicely. Should we put it in? Yeah. So we have actually screwed in. I don't know if you guys can see there. We've actually screwed in some. Do you want to put it down here so we can see? see yeah. So these are screwed in suction caps. This wood does want to float quite considerably. So yeah. if, in order to avoid that, we've got these suction caps. We need to clear just to a get, bit of get some of these. Yeah. yeah. Mine some of this away. Maybe wet the bottom of the suction cap a little bit. Oh yeah. Make sure it sticks. Top tip. You go. You good there? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Face down. Yeah, that one's good. Is yours good? Mm -hmm. oh, yep. Yeah. Will be. Mine's not either. <laughs> <laughs> it's little bits of substrate. Yeah, you only need um, a tiny bit, don't get you? Get in. Could do with a little bit of a tissue. I find a good tip is if you've got a rain butt at home in the garden, water butt. Yeah. Drop your wood in there and forget about it for a while, and then yeah. it'll, it'll soak and be ready to use. Mine's, 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 stuck, mine's stuck, down stuck down. Yeah, mine is as well now. Yeah. No, it's not. Huh? Yeah, but I have got my glamorous assistant. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Hopefully it'll stay down. You're nothing worse than floating wood, honestly. <laughs> it's, um, it's happened to me a few times. In fact, the first Tropic Alive, the wood moved. Don't know if you watched it. Yeah. Mm. Quite, um, you're making it worse. <laughs> right. Try hold it and you can. Got so much, too much powder on it and it doesn't yep. want to stick. Try now. There you go. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to lean it forward a bit. Cool. So, okay, now time for our sand. Yeah. So we have, we've actually blended a couple of different types, haven't we? So this is from Wio. Yeah. Um, let's see if we can show, in fact, we'll do a, do a jug and then we can show people close up. So if we go, do you want to do the slider? So if you guys can see that, and you can all of it, zoom, no, zoom, zoom. You see it? Yeah. So it's a mixture of uh, two different types of sand. Mm -hmm. One is elderly. We've no. got the um, Secura? Cimarron. Cimarron sand and the Heaven sand from Wio, so which is a much lighter, yeah. uh, whiter sand. And then the Cimarron has got small granules of la and larger granules of yeah, sand. Yeah, a mixture of size granules. Yeah, slightly rockier texture to it. Yeah. And the idea of mixing it is it just creates an even more naturalistic appearance. And this right. is something that's kind of what you saw yeah. in the river, right? Yep. So I'll tell you what, you carry on doing that and I'm going to ask you questions. Okay. So when you, um, when you were diving or snorkeling, were you snorkeling mm. or did you do proper diving? I, I have done diving in that region. Um, it's mostly easier to snorkel because it's so shallow and there's so many sunken logs and fallen branches and things that if you're diving, it can actually be a bit dangerous because okay. your kit gets caught on everything. Uh -huh. um, ooh, so yeah, I'll, right. I'll sort that out, you carry on. And um, so snorkeling is, is easier and you can explore much more of the habitat. Uh, it's much less, uh, invasive to the animals around, they don't get spooked so much. Yeah. Um, and one of the biggest things is, is we can't really use uh, fins when we're there. It, when we're snorkeling, oh, we're just it moving around. Everything. Yeah. It stirs up all the sediment and makes it quite diff difficult. Cool. Um, we carry on, I'm going to get another jug. All right. So did you, when I used to go sub aqua diving and um, I did uh, three weeks in Belize, yeah. and I used to love the really shallow areas because yep. that's where all the light was and all the color. Because as you go deeper, you lose the red part of the spectrum. Yep. So one of my favorite things was just to sort of sit in a shallow area next to a coral head and just sit there for like, you know, 20 minutes, just almost meditating and watching all the little communities going, doing their business, you know? I totally agree. When it, it's interesting in freshwater as well, like, my thing is to just drift and observe, and then the fish kind of lose their fear of you. Um, you can just cruise along, m make really detailed observation of what's going on. Yeah. Um, another thing I used to do this for filming is I put my camera on a tripod, 
Yeah. And I cable tied uh, diving weights to the tripod oh, right, so it could okay. sit on the riverbed. Yeah, yeah. And I back away a little bit, and the fish come and they, they check out the camera, they're curious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they lose their fear of it. And you can sort of watch them interacting with it as well, which is nice. Yeah. But definitely the shallow, shallow areas where it's at, it's where so much is going on. Yeah. I guess it's, um, yeah, it's where all the light is. It's warmer, I guess, as well in the shallows. Yeah, it's. Um, Especially for the smaller fish that might interest you and me as aquarists, mm -hmm. you don't want to be in deep water. That's where the predators are. Right. You want to be in the shallows, near to cover, near to the margins. Um, there's more food there in, in some ways amongst the, the plants, and um, you're less likely to be snapped up by yeah. a big predator. What what kind of um, what's the most risky thing that you would actually see in the in the river? Um, Ana not anacondas? Or? The anacondas aren't bothered by you and you're not big because you're not big enough to be a threat. Oh, okay. Um, and you're too too big to be prey. Right, so I there's see. Just, so you're happy medium. Yeah, the smaller ones will just flee. Right. And the bigger ones just don't care if you're there. Yeah. Um, actually, in not so much in, in the crystal rivers but like this one, but in the Pantanal, biggest danger really is uh, sunken logs and branches because if you Sometimes the water's quite murky. Mm. You can get caught on stuff, you can get snagged on stuff. Currents can be quite tricky. Um, and I've had several instances where I've been sort of caught up against a large sunken tree and the current buffeting me, I couldn't get off it. And you oh, can't really? get to the surface, you can't get... That's That's, scary. that's the scariest yeah. things I've had. Um, animals, I mean, there are in the water. Um, in the Pantanal, we've got giant otters. Oh, right. are, how big do they get? Two meters. Really? And they can live in family groups of up to 40. Oh my and gosh. they're incredibly aggressive. Wow. Um, if they've got young with them, they'll come after you. And that's, yeah. you know, they wouldn't harm you too much, but it can be quite intimidating. Yeah. Um, stingrays, you know, stepping on a stingray is not going to be fun. Um, yeah, check out Steve Irwin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, I mean, there's all sorts of other unpleasantries, dengue fever, um, other diseases. There's, along the banks, you've got scorpions and bullet ants and corals. You're, you're really selling it now. Well, I mean, this river isn't quite that bad, but uh, <laughs> the general region has got plenty of things to keep you on your toes. Um, that's part of the adventure. We just need to make sure there's enough sand to plant into. So we've got, there's probably an inch or so, and it probably need a little bit more tie, I'd say. Are we gonna, are we gonna leave the front area? That's going to be planted. That's going to be fully planted. Yeah. yeah okay. So a bit more sand. So a bit more then. Yeah. Someone told us you were far away from civilization doing these. Um, not, not particularly far from civilization. It's interesting that you know the the city where I was based had a million people. Uh, three hours driving, you're near to this uh, river, and there's towns around and villages. Um, in the Pantanal wetlands itself, where I spend most of my time. Um, you could be fairly remote in that the only access was by uh, boat during the, the wet season especially, um, and it could take several hours to get to the nearest you know, wow. place. And if you had a problem, an injury or something, um, that, could be, that bit, could be a real issue. Bit of a drama. Um, but it, yeah, you're not, you're not you know, completely in the wilds. I mean, I have been in places very, that are very remote, but not in, not in this case. Hmm. So when you, were, when you were actually studying, were you kind of recording sightings of different fish, counting stuff? What yeah. was the actual kind of method you were doing? So we had um, observational methods and um, collection. Mm -hmm. So we used uh, nets and panning sieves, okay. uh, me and my team, getting into the water and uh, just seeing how many individuals of each species we could collect yeah. um, in the nets and in the, in the sieves. And then my underwater observation was using photographic equipment to record sp certain species that we didn't end up in our nets. Uh, also record some behavior and dynamics which helped tell the story of the fish populations there. Mm. Um, so you make observations during the wet season and the dry season, you compare them, contrast them. Cool. Um, yeah, a lot of it was observational, but a lot of it was collecting specimens, then going to the lab, trying to identify them yeah. and uh, building up data. So you could say, well, we know that in the wet season, this species is really dominant, but in the dry season, it disappears, and it helps uh, paint a picture of the community of the fish in the river. Awesome. Do you think that's enough sand, mate? I think that'll be yeah. fine, yeah. That's my hotel room key card. I don't want to lose Don't that. lose that. 
also doubles up as a great scraper. I was going to say, one of the reasons that we just put a bit of moss on at each end yeah. is, like I said, in the wild, these, this wood will be constantly grazed on by various armoured catfish. Mm. You don't see a lot of mosses there because it gets sort of bulldozed off by yeah. these fish. So you might find the odd bit, um, but it's not, not that common. But we've added some here to... It's a bit of artistic colour. licensing, isn't it? I mean, it's actually taxophyllum spiky, which you don't find in South America. But it's there, a moss and it looks like some of the mosses that you would find. There is a moss there which is similar, known as the bonito moss, okay. which has been uh, recorded there. Um, and I've seen mosses in the region, so it's cool. not exactly the same one, but... Excellent. Okay, I think it's time to talk about some of the more beautiful plants yeah. that we've got. So we've had some pre-prepared yeah. uh, by our, uh, our, new, our latest marketing colleague, Sarah Casper. Many, yep. many people watching won't know who she is by now, hopefully. So um, this, oh, let's start off with the foreground. So yeah. let's go here and I'll tell you what, I'm going to do some nice close-ups. Yeah, you can do, mate. There's a spray bottle there as well, just in case. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the plants. First, yep. first one, I'm going to do a nice close-up here for everyone. So this is Hydrocotyl verticillata. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this growing in the wild? Yeah, lots of it. And is it, is it carpet like mad? Meters and meters and meters and meters of it. And does it, is it look like the mushrooms like we see in aquascaping or is it different? Um, it looks, yeah, pretty much similar. Okay. Uh, it'll just covered in detritus and algae is <laughs> the yeah. main difference. So this is actually in Tropica's uh, potted range. It's an advanced category plant. So it will need good light, which we've got here with the Wio Bamboo 70. It's actually 70 watts. Mm -hmm. So more than enough for this shallow tank. We'll talk about more about the, uh, the brightness later because that's important for some of the reds, isn't it? And yeah, we're going to plant a basically uh, full on carpet around, around here. Yeah. So let's start doing that now. I've got some tweezers for you. Thank you. We uh, put the tray on here. You, you, do, you start doing that, and I'm going to talk right. about uh, another species. Oh. Put that down there for a second. <laughs> so, let's see if I can remember the full name of this one. <laughs> Halanthium bolivianum quadricostatus, I think. Very good. Yeah. So. This is actually easy and it's actually a bit of a brute. I don't know if you've used this in aqua. You have used it now, I know you have. Mm. And it carpets really quickly. It's, a, it's a, almost like a giant version of Helanthium tenilum. And it, yeah, it sends out runners prolifically. In fact, you can see a runner there. And it will quite quickly take over your aquascape if you're not careful. So do keep it in check. Easy plant. Doesn't necessarily need CO2 injection or high levels of lighting. But as with all aquarium plants, you'll get much better results if you use CO2 injection. So we're going to plant this kind of intermittently amongst the... Yes, yeah, so um, I think... Uh, how, would, how would it be in nature? I think we've got a photo of the, exactly how it would be in nature. So okay. the, these two species, they sort of often end up being mixed together. Okay. Sort of matrix of both. Cool. Um, the Helianthium uh, in the tropical sun goes a beautiful reddish purple colour. Mm -hmm. Uh, you do find large stands of it by itself, but it's not unusual to find it mixed together with the hydrocotyl and uh, Echinodorus species mixed in with it. So uh, this particular photo that I think uh, Tomas has got up there um, is the one that we're using to inspire this biotope. Awesome. And uh, do let us know if you want to see Tropica spray bottles. I do. <laughs> do you? Yeah. Who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> No pressure, Radu. <laughs> okay, let me know if you want me to pass you some more over. Yeah, I've just still got my... Uh, i got a bit batch there. Good enough to... So, yeah, this, this Hydrocotyl verticillata is actually really getting more popular in aquascaping, used as like an accent plant. Mm -hmm. uh, it's intermittently with other carpeting plants, so it just adds that extra kind of texture, a bit of a contrasting texture with the round leaves versus like the more spiky texture of a lot of other carpeting species. We can plant it really densely, can't we? We've got a yeah. lot of plants here. How yeah. many pots did we use altogether uh, of the hydrocotyl? I think we've got 10 pots. 10 pots. Houses. So. But it's great, you know, the heavy we, more heavily we plant, the less chance of algae we get. I so mean, if someone wanted to do this at home, they wouldn't need to buy so 10 much, pots. No. They could buy two or three, this plant will carpet oh. when given the right conditions. Are we gonna keep, we're gonna do something around here, aren't we? We can still put a, yeah? Yeah, don't worry. Okay. So, um, 
and in the wild, I see sometimes, you know, 10 meters of this stuff really? growing in considerable flow as well. And does it stay quite over low carpet? It stays low. And compact? Yeah, because it's got so much sun uh, from the tropical sunlight there. Wow. And uh, stays low, very dense sometimes. Didn't I see a photo of yours or some video and the leaves had some red on them? Of the, of the Helanthium? Of the Helanthium, yeah. So they can go reddish to mauve purple colour. Um, like many Echinodorus and Helanthium species, um, under high light, they can develop these lovely red tinges, pink tinges. Yeah. And um, in the aquarium, it's a little harder to achieve that uh -huh. because we can't mimic the sun as much as we'd like to. No, of course. Um, but the sun is the mother of all light. We found a way <laughs> to uh, get around that, which we'll look yeah. at later. Yeah. And it's, it's safe to say we're not using, we're using some cultivars today, aren't we? Yeah. So we'll talk about those in more detail later. But we couldn't, some of the plants that you saw in nature aren't actually readily available in the hobby. So the main uh, plant, I think, in the photo that Tomas showed earlier is uh, Echinodorus macrophyllus. This is a really large Amazon sword plant. Mm -hmm. um, it is a brute, it gets very big. Under high light, it can get these lovely red and pink shades to it. Right. Um, depending on the light levels and flow and nutrients, it can be quite variable. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really a commonly found in the hobby. Right. So we've used some cultivars to mimic different stages of the plant. Oh, okay. You know, when it's slightly more green, when it's slightly more pink. When and they've it's got bigger, similar smaller. leaf shape, similar growth pattern. More or less. It's, yeah. We have to, again, we have to use some artistic license, but this is something I think is really important when people want to do a biotope, not to get too hung up on having exactly the right plant species or exactly the right fish species. If you've got, you know, you do your research and there's something you can't get hold of. Yeah. There's no shame in using a substitute. Yeah. You know, it's, it's unreasonable to. No one's going to like shoot to give up anything, because right? you yeah. can't find that species. No. Um, and I think that's really important for people to remember. Yeah. You're supposed to be having fun. You're supposed to be creating something. Yeah. Uh, beautiful that you're going to enjoy, and you know, don't get too worried about being too accurate. Too accurate. And there's quite a lot of plant species out there that do suit a biotope. So mm. you might find alternatives and yeah don't despair and what do you think is uh, so special about biotope aquascaping versus like the regular sort of high-end nature aquarium aquascaping that we often see these days i think because you really are mimicking as best as you can yeah a piece of the natural world right. and bringing it into your home you know we're always filling our homes with house plants and striving to be closer to nature yeah well what could be trying to get closer to nature than recreating a piece of tropical river in your suburban living room mm. with plants and fish as best as you can from that area. Yeah. Um, I think because people know a version of it out exists out in the real world, yeah. it can be quite rewarding to recreate your own version of it. And do you um, think there's something uh, quite special about because you're because you are looking after something that is more closely mimicking nature you're going to be more inclined to learn more about its natural habitat and they maybe take a bit more interest in the conservation of that area. I'm, yeah, this is why I'm so hot on biotope aquaria is because it connects people not just to wild and beautiful regions of the world with amazing plants and fish, but it also brings them into understanding and being more aware of the conservation issues. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of the habitats that I explore in Brazil, you, we see the day-to-day -day reality of say, cattle ranching or soy farming um, that's destroying these habitats. Yeah. And you know, if someone decides to do a biotope and they start researching it and they think, oh wow, actually that place is being destroyed and mm. is disappearing. And it, it may add an, a bit of urgency to understanding yeah. more and trying to delve into the world of that place. Yeah, and what is, for people that aren't aware, what, what, what is, why is this deforestation and the habitat destruction occurring? Well, in Brazil, it's principally agro-business. Agriculture. Agriculture, which is based on the demand for, for instance, our Western demand for beef, right. of which I'm guilty of. I love the barbecue as much I as the next person. I love person. a good steak, yeah. Um, but it's often fed on uh, soy or other feeds, which need to be grown. Right. Um, and it needs to be all grass-fed, in which case forest is cut down and turned into pasture. Um, oh, so even grass-fed beef isn't... You, 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 Things that are fed on grass, you know, 
a lot of grasses, say in Latin America, are not really suitable for grazing cattle. Right. So what they'll do is they'll burn it all off and then they'll plant invasive Af African grasses, yeah. the kind that things like uh, gazelle and, and uh, buffalo are grazing on in the Serengeti, mm -hmm. and plant them instead. And um, they're much more resilient, they're much hardier, but they don't have a place in that ecosystem. No. Um, and it prevents any forest really from coming back after having been decimated. And it's soy, for example, uses huge amounts of water, uses yeah. lots of pesticides, uses lots of uh, agrochemicals which leach into rivers. Oh. So I've seen so the algae blooms and yeah, I mean a couple of these crystal rivers that I know. I uh, went recently, and all the plants were smothered in uh, algae, big black, you know, filamentous algae, yeah. which normally they wouldn't be, and it's due to uh, agricultural runoff that's feeding that algae. Oh Smothers the plants, they die, the, the whole ecosystem kind of disappears. So what can people do to help? It can be quite overwhelming. I think the biggest thing is some of your choices, perhaps. Food choices? Yeah, where you buy your food, from which companies, what's in it. Yeah. You know, an easy one to highlight, but a difficult one to avoid is palm oil. Mm. So, you it's know, in everything, isn't it? Palm oil is in everything, but it's in Southeast Asia, it's decimating um, lots of really fragile habitats. Mm. It's a very lucrative crop. Um, soy, which is also in so many things, but if you can try and avoid it, if you can try and buy, say, locally produced yeah. organic stuff, which is not always easy, it's often more expensive. And it's more expensive, that's but, the problem, isn't it? But I, you know, if you've got the privilege to make the choice, yes. try and make the choice. Yeah, don't just get the cheapest, you know. Which look is, into it a bit more, be a bit more responsible, I guess, with your choices. And uh, I think just try and be an ally for conservation, whether yeah. that's donating money, whether that's sharing and... Volunteering, maybe? Volunteering, or even just raising awareness about a habitat that's interesting to you, or yeah. talking about it online, trying to highlight issues. Because you, you're, you're, um, you're one of the co-founders of Freshwater Life Project? Yeah, so I've got this charity, Freshwater Life Project, which um, co-founded with two friends of mine and uh -huh. I'm a trustee of uh -huh. and it's a fairly small NGO that supports freshwater habitat conservation. So NGO, non-governmental organisation? That's correct, right. a charity, we yeah. are a registered charity um, and we try and support freshwater habitat conservation and support people who are involved in that field. Oh, cool. um, so our biggest product at the moment is actually in Cyprus with a, a Phaneus killifish oh, yeah. and um, we're looking at how we can encourage particularly local people there to value these little fish which are disappearing from uh, polluted streams and you know overused streams mm -hmm. get those habitats restored to benefit the fish but that also ends up benefiting migrating birds which use cyprus as a stop-off point on their uh, migration route to and from africa okay um, if you can make those areas protected then people can't go hunting in them and that's a country, unfortunately, where the hunting of migrating birds is a huge part of the culture. So by protecting one species, you may end up protecting others. Yeah. If it's a, an aquatic habitat, you might end up protecting amphibians and all sorts of other insects and plants that are vital to the ecosystem. So we try and support projects like that. We've also got uh, community projects in London with creating wildlife ponds for urban communities that don't normally have access to such yeah. things, try and get kids interested in nature. Mm -hmm. um, so we're sort of multifaceted, we're fairly small, but we are trying to do awesome. our part. Yeah, good. Um, it's time for another giveaway. Yeah. Can't believe we've done 40 minutes already, Ty. That's gone quick, hasn't it? 40 minutes, yeah, we better hurry up. Yeah, move on. <laughs> um, okay, next question for the giveaway is, how can the how can hydrocotyl vertical art be used if it's not rooted in the substrate? Mm. See, I only learnt this today. Oh, really? It's embarrassing. Well, I think I know, but I'm not going to say. No. Mm. So let us know in the comments in the live chat, and we'll pick a random winner at the end. So make sure you stay towards the end, which is in about 20 minutes or so. Yeah. I'm going to talk about this plant, yeah. then I'm going to talk about this one. And then I'm going to talk about this one. So we've got three species of Echinodorus. Mm -hmm. See if I can remember them all. Echinodorus isn't one of my strong suits, actually. I'm more of a cryptical rhiny kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, you like it. So we have, this is beautiful. This is Echinodorus reni, or reni. How would you say it? I say reni, but 
I may be completely wrong. Reunite, it's a beautiful, it's actually an easy category and it stays, it will potentially stay red even in low light, but more light you'll get a more red coloration. Yeah. It doesn't get too big. How, how tall would you say this will get? I think it's about 25 to 30 so it centimeters. May, it may get to the surface. Yeah, it may even rise slightly above the, the lip of the tank. Um, the leaves will broaden, elongate, they get lovely pink to reddish coloration. So this one is a, a stand-in for Echinodorus macrophyllus in its reddish state. Oh, okay, cool. So that's why we've used it. Yeah. And top tip, uh, to make planting easier, I just tear off the roots, like so. So you have about two centimetres of roots there. That's going to make planting much easier. Put that to one side, chuck those away. Then we have Echinodorus aquarata. Aquatica. Aquatica. Do apologise. Hold your rubbish with me, Echinodorus. Well, you know. And again, this, this will actually... How tall does this one grow? That's a good question. I it's think a cultivar, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think it's also about 25, 20, 25 centimetres. So we will potentially get some leaves trying to get through the surface. Which is fine. Which is fine. It isn't that humid in here, so I do wonder if we might struggle a little bit. But we could actually fit a fogger unit or a mister in the future. Or you could just prune leaves that do emerge above the surface. So oh, and promote the compact growth. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In, in, the, in the rivers there, you get fluctuating uh, water levels. So mostly it's maybe a, between a metre and a half to two metres deep. But perhaps in the dry season, this can fall considerably. Um, other environmental changes can affect it. So here we're doing a sort of snapshot of the river at its lowest and shallowest point. Yeah. And for those that were really struggling with that hydrocotyl verticalata question, you can find the answer on the Tropica website. So this is Echinodorus, I'm going to get it wrong again, Paleofolius. 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 Is this another cultivar? So this isn't a cultivar. Um, this is, gets quite tall. Uh, again, the underwater leaves can get quite broad. Okay. Uh, it will happily grow up and out the, the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we're using it as a stand-in for Echinodorus macrophyllus in its perhaps slightly larger form. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so we're using this blend of three different species mm -hmm. to simulate the different stages of one species that we can't get hold of. Oh, gotcha. And that's understand. Perfect. artistic license, but we're trying to recreate something. We're trying to recreate that looks more the or less aesthetics of exactly the, the nature. And I think it's okay to talk about what you're doing, your project that you're working on right now. Yes. The Aquatic Habitats book. Aquatic Habitats inspired by nature. Inspired by nature. So and this is kind of why you're here, really, because you, you know you're an expert on these habitats and it's it's the kind of the it's the beautiful combination of mimicking nature but using aquascaping concepts I guess is that right yes so when we talk about a biotope essentially we're talking about trying to re recreate a particular piece of habitat mm -hmm. represent a particular river or part of a river or lake or pond or whatever mm -hmm. um, and a lot of there's been a lot of you know views that that's quite limited in some ways what you can do with that um, many people think you know oh, there's not a lot of scope for using plants um, this isn't true there's many beautiful biotopes out there in the world where you find plants i mean where do our aquarium plants come from yeah um <laughs> and so well you and i are working on this book um which is trying to close the gap between traditional say nature aquarium and aquascaping yeah and biotopes so how to set up tanks that represent wild habitats, but using aquascaping elements, um, which you're, you are very hot on, of course, mm -hmm. um, and trying to, at the same time, talk about the uh, origin of the plants and fish that we use, where they come from. So we've got you know, Mexican highland streams, we've got Congo lowland lakes that we've been doing, and highlighting what those habitats uh, face in terms of conservation issues and threats mm -hmm. and trying to again get people excited about recreating a portion of the natural world in their home mm. and linking them to those places and getting them aware of how, pe people how don't, important they are. People won't actually care until they're aware of it and I guess when they're actually creating something they're going to be really aware of it aren't they and they're mm. going to take a lot more of that in the wrong place. Yeah I'm not going to castigate you but I don't want it there. No worries, <laughs> your escape. Uh, if you, you can, because, as I said, we're mixing uh, these plants to represent one species. If you plant them alongside mm. the reni, ah, okay. as these plants grow up, 
and they're going to get taller. They'll, the, the leaves will blend through, mix through. Gotcha. You've got the flow from the filter is going to cause them to wave together. Right. Um, and it's going to look much more natural. Okay. Um, and and like the, the display, display that we've got. Day, as they say. Yeah. I mean, always eager to learn from the best, Ty. Oh, well. It's, uh, <laughs> it's good fun. It is fun. I don't think I've ever planted so much hydrocotyl in my life. It's Me neither. <laughs> oh, we've got some uh, Q and A's. Excellent. Right. Uh, I'll let you plant the last one of those. Okay. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Key Tanks. How does the hydrocotyl grow immersed? Did you see it growing immersed? So verticillata, I've not encountered immersed, no. but uh, Lucasifolia, I have, oh, I've, yeah, I have yeah. seen that multiple times in, in the wild. Um, it grows, again, in a sort of carpeting fashion, right. but the leaves are much uh, softer mm -hmm. uh, in some ways. It's a bit like... Um, What's a cilantro? I'm trying to think of the herb. Coriander. Oh, yeah. In terms of the leaf yeah, yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends if it's in a very humid or in a drier environment. Um, it'll often be found growing along the margins of rivers and lakes in amongst grass, for example, and other marginal plants. Uh -huh. um, I imagine that verticillata, where it does grow on outside the water, is often on muddy, muddy river banks. Um, and again, quite, quite dense, quite compact based on what I know of the other, other members of the species. Yeah. Now, we're going to start filling soon, mate, I think. Very slowly, I think. Yeah, because the sand can be quite cloudy. We have washed it. Yeah. It's going to need to go over there, I think. So hopefully it's not going to go too cloudy, and we'll fill up as slow as we can get away with. Yeah. Using our special Tropica substrate bag. <laughs> Is it on? Okay, cool. Uh, do you have one handy? Cool. Perfect. Okay, next question from uh, Vishwar Raj. Which was the river you faced the toughest challenge, Ty? And how about the ecosystem there? Um, I think definitely the, the Salobra River where I did my master's research in okay. Pantanal. Yeah. Um, just because it's so variable from season to season, um, you can go and suddenly it's really murky, you can't see anything, or it's suddenly really, really deep and it's difficult to operate with the nets, mm -hmm. or the flow has really increased and it's actually quite dangerous to be in the water. Um, there's mosquitoes, there's leeches, there's ticks, there's disease, um, there's plenty of snakes and other things. There's things like the, the bullet ant, which is so-called because oh, I've heard of those. it's... Uh, Feels like a bullet. It's hit, yeah. bite, yeah. It's pretty high up there on the pain scale. Um, but mostly it's the environmental changes that are difficult. Um, however, the biggest problem for me was while I was there at one point, the uh, fires that had been deliberately set to burn the grasslands mm. right. um, created so much smoke, smoke mm -hmm. that you, I mean, it felt like evening in the middle of the day yeah. and you were choking on the smoke whilst trying to do your field work. Um, which was a real challenge yeah. and also really distressing because you knew that habitat was being burned and animals were dying and yeah. things were being destroyed and you were there trying to do your field work in the yeah. name of science and conservation. And they were destroying it. And it was, your, yeah, and that was really hard. It's quite a dichotomy, isn't it? A juxtaposition, I think they call that. Yeah. You were trying to like, help stuff and they're trying to destroy stuff. This is the, That's nice. the conservationist's ongoing a dilemma. dilemma. Yeah the things that they face, and you can't give up hope and you can't no, you desist can't. because that's and not going to improve. And that's really important for people like you to kind of educate and inspire, you know, and hopefully this, this aquascape, has, this workshop has helped, you know, hopefully some people watching would have learnt loads, I've learnt loads, no. and um, you know, people can take more of an interest in these things and make the world a better place, hopefully. We must okay, uh, strive let's, for that. Yes, let's go for... Uh, Kari Kumar, Ty, do you see a lot of red plants in the wild? Um, so, 
I have actually. Uh, one of the plants in the Rio Sucuri that we find is called Myriophyllum aquaticum, which is known as parrot's feather. Yes. Normally in ponds it's used and it's green. Under the tropical sun it goes this beautiful reddish orange colour. Mm -hmm. uh, another one that I've seen is uh, Ludwigia inclinata. Yeah, um, beautiful. Goes intense red. Yeah. Put it in your aquarium, goes green, yeah. uh, which can be <laughs> quite frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's uh, plants like Ludwigia sedoides, floating plant. Oh, um, is that one that grows in the in the a spiral beautiful pattern? diamond pattern? Yeah. Again, put it in the aquarium, yeah, it doesn't it, like it. Dies, yeah. um, so it's quite hard to maintain some of those red plants. Um, but even things like uh, Ceratophyllum demersum, which I see out there, the hornwort, yes. yeah, yeah. under good lighting, that can go red. Um, it's all about the lighting, really. <laughs> so yeah, it, I do see some species. Uh, Ludwigia peruensis is another one that can go reddish purple color. Okay. Uh, it's a beautiful plant. You can find that in the hobby sometimes. Um, and the beautiful lily, Nymphaea gardneriana, uh, which is this carpeting lily, that goes intense red as well. Okay. Okay, I've got a question I can answer here. Oblivious End, do you guys have any tips for a newbie at aquascaping? Yes, I would um, consider your budget and, and consider how much time you have to spare and try to buy the highest quality that you can afford and don't go necessarily too big and kind of blow your budget and it'll cost you loads to plant it and, and kit it out and take you a lot of time to maintain it. So go for something maybe relatively small, like a 60 centimetre. Yeah. And just, just but the biggest thing is have fun, but do a bit of research. Um, start off with easy plants so you'll succeed, you'll get confidence. You might even want to copy an aquascape or be inspired by an aquascape, nothing wrong with copying. Get your confidence levels up and then you can kind of take it, use your own creativity and yeah. with each iteration get a little bit better. But the biggest thing is have fun, practice, and enjoy it. Any tips from you? I would say your point about copying is really good. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's many of my earliest biotopes were imitations of things that you'd done. <laughs> and that set me down the path that I'm on now. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's no shame in doing it. And if it looks kind of like what you were hoping for, great. If it looks a bit different, that's fine too. Yeah. Uh, you learn and adapt. And it's perfectly fine to be inspired by other people and uh, try and mimic them. That's actually flattering. Yeah, and if you want to be inspired by Aquascapes, Tropica have an inspiration page. So you, I think there's how many? We did do a quiz on this. How many? 120, 122, I think, Aquascapes now on the Tropica inspiration page. Uh, a diverse range of styles of Aquascapes, obviously diverse range of plants, you know, levels of easy, easiness, uh, tank sizes, something for everyone. Um, Next question, Darth Scaper, Ty and George, what is your favourite fish? Mine is the Neon Tetra. Mine's probably the Green Neon Tetra. There we go, high five for Paracoridon. Boosh! <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Mario Douglas, water parameters, are you going for more acidic pH levels, water hardness and so forth? So, interestingly in the Rio Sucuri, um, it's because it's a mixture of the cast stream, so it's water that's come through um, limestone, bedrock, and then it's also got lots of organic material from the surrounding forest falling into it. Um, pH is actually fairly normal, it's around 7. Um, temperature is about 26 degrees. Um, it's not particularly hard, neither particularly soft, because um, it's balanced out. Um, if we were going for a Pantanal habitat, a lowland wetland habitat, we'd have a much more acidic, um, much more soft water and black water habitat. Um, the nice thing with this particular display is it's something that could be achieved in most places just with dechlorinated tap water pretty much and mm. um, e even if you had quite hard water it won't affect these plants and the fish that we're going to use let's talk about the fish yeah, tie can can handle a huge variety of parameters so what fish are we going to put in here so we're going <laughs> to use a very well known little fish which is a tetra which is the serpe tetra hypercebricum equis equis yeah which is a bright red little fish has a massive distribution across south america okay uh, cis Andean South America, so to the uh, east of the Andes. It's my supervisor's favorite fish, which is one of the reasons we have to use it, but it's also one of my favorite fishes. And it's a fish that's encountered in this habitat. It's really easy. Um, they have a reputation as fin nippers. This is normally when they're kept in small groups uh, with other species. These fish are always trying to establish a hierarchy within the group. Once they've established that hierarchy, who's boss? 
uh, which they will do by nipping each other's fins and chasing each other around, they will look at whoever else is in the tank and see, well, we need to see who's in charge now. And they may chase other fish around. But if you keep a large group of them, particularly if you have a larger tank, there's always a new challenger to the hierarchy. There's always someone trying to be the boss. Yeah. And so the attention stays within the group. They will just keep trying to nip each other, chase each other around, and they will leave other fish alone. In this tank, because we're only using a small group of them. How many? I think... Eight? Ten? Six in here. Six? It's, yeah, we, you either see them in quite large groups along the bank or in the open, open water amongst plants. You mm -hmm. see little groups of maybe three to six of them kind of cruising around at the base of, of plants and in denser cover. Mm -hmm. um, you see some plants are wanting to pop up here and just push them back down. Yeah, it's quite uh, sandy, so it's quite loose. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're a great fish. They're readily available in the hobby. They'll eat pretty much everything. They'll tolerate a wide variety of water parameters. Cheers. And they're quite affordable. Yeah, they're very readily available in most stores, aren't they? Yep. In fact, they're colourful and really colourful. They were insanely colourful though in your footage. Yeah. Um, so the ones in the wild that I tend to film, one of the reasons they're so colourful, I think is just based on diet. They're right. consuming so many uh, microorganisms, so much protein. Yeah. Um, if you think about flamingos that eat the, the tiny shrimps. microorganisms that turn them pink. Yeah. It's sort of similar for the for the serpe tetras. It's the same with my Amano shrimp in my discus tank. They really? eat loads of beef heart. And they go red. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes, makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they're an ideal beginner's fish if you keep them by themselves in a, in a small tank. Yeah. Um, but they will go into larger community tanks if kept in decent numbers. Cool. Um, we'll be putting some in at some point once this tank has matured and uh, everything's starting to grow in, filters matured, everything's settled. You don't want to be throwing your fish in straight away after setting up. Uh, we could do with another extension lead if we've got a helper on hand. Another extension cable? We'll find one. Don't worry. So we're nearly full. We'll turn the filter on and then it's nearly time to say... Yeah. Is it time for another giveaway soon? Carl May has got a question. George, you've recently mentioned your awareness towards fish and their health within an aquarium has drastically increased compared to your aquascaping days. Do you think Ty has had an influence on this? Yes, I think he has. It's made me... I think generally as I get more older and... and um, why is there dare i say i just feel a bit more connected with with the planet and and the living entities on it and i just think that anything that any animal that's within our care we have a duty of care responsibility to give it the best home we can you and i've had some really good the, conversations about yeah, the ethics have. of fish keeping and yeah I, my background partly is in in london zoo i used to work as an actress for london zoo where the principal you know absolute rule priority was fish welfare yeah um that was really an education for me, not in that I wasn't interested in it before, but showed how it was such a priority. And I've brought that on into my, my hobby area. Yeah. And I think it's fundamental. If you've got a living creature, you need to take responsibility and care for it and basically love it. Make sure it has a great life. Yeah. Um, you need to turn on the light as well. Can I do that? Yeah. Let's do it. This isn't working. Try this one. Technical issues. Uh, do we adjust the exposure on that? Is it too bright? The camera? Have a look. Yeah, it's nice and too bright. Let's go down. Get the cool issues. Should have. Cool. Looks great, Ty. Yeah, I mean, we've used the, the shallow tank here. Um, you could do this in pretty much any size uh, tank. Um, you could do it in quite a large tank and have more species that are found there, such as the Caracidium data caracins. Um, some of the uh, armoured catfish, the Loricarids, Ancestrus, a larger group of, of Serpe tetras. Um, shallow tank in this case is quite good because it means the plants get lots of light and you can really appreciate them looking down at this carpet that will fill out. 
Cool. That's too dark now. Which camera are we on, Thomas? Which camera are we on? It's just changing all the OK, time. what's so this exposure should I like? Turn it up. OK. So I turn up the lights? Just leave it. Yep. No. OK, can we plug the filter in now? We can. And hopefully it will. Hopefully, as I primed it earlier. I spent all morning trying to sort it out. Not open. Okay, more questions. Uh, Nicola Ivo. Oh, hi, Nicola. Uh, what are the invertebrates like in the natural habitat? Any invertebrates? Any shrimp? Um, snails? Yeah, so lots of, lots of snails uh, that I don't know enough about to tell you what they are. Uh, the shrimp there are mostly sort of glass shrimp, river shrimp. Right. Uh, locally, they're known as pitu. And you see them at night. If you go um, with a torch near the riverbank at night, that's when they're out there, when they're active. There's also a small crayfish that we find there. Um, and sometimes there are fish that have almost uh, rabbits like teeth and molars, and they'll catch these crayfish. And you're in the water, and you can hear this like crunch, crunch, crunch. crunch. And it's these fish have caught one, and they're just like grinding it down. Oh, wow. Um, so you do see shrimp. They're not available in the hobby, um, as well as the snails. But uh, you could always put some Amano shrimp in and pretend they're river shrimp. Yeah. Uh, that would be look similar, don't totally they? fine. And they would also help you with your tank maintenance. Yeah, of course. Good. OK, last question uh, from Gus. Hello, Gus. May I ask what Ty did in his thesis in? At yes. What did you do your thesis in? So my thesis was the, um, the fishes of the Salobra River and basically uh, looking at the community so creating a, a catalogue of species and looking at seasonal differences between wet season and dry season, how this changed, um, and basically, yeah, forming a catalogue of the community of the fishes of the Salobra River and the Pantanal. Yeah, awesome. OK, let's talk about, now the tank's full. I think it looks great. Well done, Ty. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about maintenance. So right. usual thing for me, you know, big frequent water changes at the start. We are going to be adding CO2 because we've got lots of light. If we don't add CO2 to a tank with lots of light, we just get algae. Yep. So we need to balance the light and CO2. Uh, lots of frequent water changes. I'd be using, uh, I probably wouldn't necessarily use a liquid fertilizer from day one on this because these are all potted plants. They have a big nutrient store already in them. And so we could probably start adding the fertilizers after the first week or two. Uh, keep an eye on the plants. If they start to show yellow growth or pale growth, then maybe add some fertilizers then for sure. Um, I'd have the light on for probably six hours to start with, maybe going up to eight hours in the longer term. Um, but, you know, tank like this, really, really easy to maintain. It's very shallow. It doesn't hold much water, particularly 50% water change isn't going to take too long. Really easy to trim. We all need to do a lot of trimming in this. Lots of, the, especially the helanthium. I, I think one of the things is like uh, initially your sword plants, so they've got their immersed leaves right now, yeah. uh, the very secondodorous. Some of those will, will die off as the new submersed, the underwater leaves emerge. Yeah. Um, so people who are new to this plant might go, oh, my plant's dying. If plants go yellow, if they start to sort of fall apart, the leaves, mm -hmm. chop them off. And that will also allow the plant to give energy to the new growth and to adapt to its now submersed state. Um, so don't, don't panic if leaves are turning yellow and sort of disintegrating cut them off and give your plant the, uh, the energy it needs. Um, the helanthium will go quite mad, but one of the reasons I've mixed it in with the hydrocotyl is because A, I see it that way in the wild, but also the hydrocotyl will prevent the helanthium from taking over every square inch of space. Mm -hmm. um, they're both quite dominant, so they'll butt up against each other, and that'll create a nice sort of matrix, a mosaic across the, the tank substrate, yeah. and also keep the, the helanthium in check a little bit. Awesome. Okay, let's announce our giveaway winners. So congratulations to those that got it right, but even bigger congratulations to the winners. So Ian is the winner of the first question, and the answer is Neptune Wood from WIO. So congratulations, Ian. Make sure you uh, email live at tropica.com from the YouTube uh, email that you regist registered your YouTube account with. And the answer for the second question was that you can use hydrocotyl vertical art as a floating plant. And Dennis van Opstal won that, so congratulations, Dennis. You will be receiving some Tropica Live merch very soon. And I've seen, seen it growing like that in the wild. Yeah, floating? Yeah, well, the current will sometimes lift it up, and then it snags on some uh, tree branches or on a fallen log, 
and just is suspended in the current and will just keep sucking up nutrients in the water column wow. and will go or reach up to the surface. So That's awesome. It will grow that way. So you've seen it in the wild. Yeah. People are asking how your first live experience was. Wonderful. <laughs> it's been fantastic. I get to be here with my great friend George. I've made new friends here who've been amazing hosts. You can, you can tell it's what you really think when the camera's not rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I was awful. No, it's been like to come out to Denmark to see the process behind producing these plants has been really eye-opening. Um, you were saying a really nice thing yesterday because we were in the greenhouse and you were telling, you were saying like when you see the, the, the Tropica pot in the store, you now know the people that are behind it. Yeah. And that give, yeah. that, that's quite a powerful um, thing, isn't it? Radu introduced me to two members of staff yesterday who are the two members of staff who tie all the plants onto yeah. decor, onto wood or rock. So now every time I see tropic plants on wood or rock in a shop, I'm like, yeah, yeah. well, I know who did, yeah, that, I did that 900 miles away. Yeah. And I know where that story started. And now yeah. it's here and it's going to go into a customer's tank. And, and, and some of the employees here have been here for like 40 years plus. And wow. some of them went on the original expeds with, with uh, Holger. Fantastic. Yeah, I used to take them to, to see the natural habitats. So well, let's, best let's, let's hopefully go with our CEO. He can take us, maybe. Yeah. Well, we, we need to go out. I've, I've said. I know Lars is watching. To, so. All right, Lars. Well, next year, May, <laughs> <laughs> all expenses. No, um, I definitely want to take the team to the Rio Sucuri. The, the team from the Rio Sucuri, which is an eco-tourist destination, okay. have said we're more than welcome to come uh, do a research and development trip. Yeah. Um, they'd be happy to host us. Wow. And there's scientists and friends out there who could take us to all sorts of amazing planted habitats. We can give, discover some new plants. Yeah, we could try and introduce things to the hobby yeah. and uh, inspire people with images and photos out there and yeah, say, yeah, yeah. look, you can do this if you have the plants and yeah. this is how to go about it. So no pressure, but um, yeah. Even if we don't, we do it Tropico, we do it for the book anyway. Well, yeah, we definitely need trips for the book. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so uh, it's time to wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, looking at this camera. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks to Ty for coming again. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, thanks to all the Tropica team, Radu, Thomas, Jonas, all the sales team, all the, all the managers, everyone. It's been a, a real group effort, this uh, Tropica Live. It's not just me and the guests, trust me. Um, thank you to WIO, of course, for sponsoring mm. the beautiful aquarium, cabinet, lighting, substrate, and hardscape materials. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Tropica newsletter. If you go on Instagram, it's the, the link in the bio. You can go on tropica.com and it's on the landing page, really easy to do, and you'll get notified about future Tropica Live events. Next one is in December. You might be able to guess what it is. Um, I might sing jingle bells, I might give them a clue, but I won't. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a good fun one, a good family one. So um, if you do have family, children, it's really one to get them involved with as well. Uh, don't forget to follow all of the Tropical Live updates. So all the aquariums we've created so far. So we've done the classic nature aquarium in the Awaze Starline 85. We've done the Brazilian aquascape in the Awaze Scaper Line 90. And now, of course, we've done the Brazilian biotope in the Wio Vistas 75F. And we will be doing up regular update videos on all of these aquascapes for the Tropica YouTube channel. So make sure you are subscribed and click that bell so you get notified every time we upload a new video. We are still doing the Tropica plant profiles as well. We'll be doing more cinematics and also aquarium tips videos. So make sure you are subscribed to us. Finally, follow us on all our social media channels, Instagram and Facebook at Tropica Aquarium Plants. If you want to have a chance of getting your content featured, use the hashtag made with Tropica. And if you want to, I think that's it. Oh, Tropica Live, if you've been inspired by anything we've done here, any of the Tropica Live aquascapes, use the hashtag Tropica Live. I think that's it. Yeah, sounds like. I had such good fun that went so quickly. It did go fast, but time flies when you're having fun. Thanks, mate. Let's go down the pub. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go and have a, a drink. Cheers. Take care, for everyone. See you on the next one. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you.
Yeah.